Zenker's diverticulectomy He indications for repairing a Zenker's diverticulum are partial. Obstruction, dysphagia, a choking sensation, pain on swallowing, or coughing spells associated with aspirations of fluid from the diverticulum. The diagnosis is confirmed by a barium swallow. The pouch appears suspended by a narrow neck from the esophagus. Zenker's diverticulum is a hernia of mucosa through a weak point located in the midline of the posterior wall of the esophagus where the inferior constrictors of the pharynx meet the cricopharyngeal muscle, figure 1. The neck of the diverticulum arises just above the cricopharyngeal muscle, lies behind the esophagus, and usually projects left of midline. The barium collects and remains in the herniated mucosa of the esophagus. He patient should be on a clear liquid diet for several days before operation. He or she should gargle with an antiseptic mouthwash. Antibiotic therapy may be initiated endotracheal. Anesthesia is preferred through a cuffed endotracheal tube that is inflated to prevent any aspiration of material from the diverticulum. If general anesthesia is contraindicated, the operation can be performed under local or regional infiltration. The patient is placed in a semi erect position with a folded sheet under the shoulders. The head is angulated backward. Figure 2. The chin may be turned toward the right side if the surgeon wishes the patient's hair is covered with a snug gauze or mesh cap to avoid contamination of the field. The skin is prepared routinely, and the line of incision is marked along the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, centered at the level of the thyroid cartilage, figure 2. Skin Towels may be eliminated by using a sterile adherent transparent plastic drape. A large sterile sheet with an oval opening completes the draping the surgeon stands on the patient's left side. He or she should be thoroughly familiar with the anatomy of the neck and aware that a sensory branch of the cervical plexus, the cervical cutaneous nerve, crosses the incision two or three centimeters below. The angle of the jaw, figure 3. The Sir Gion applies firm pressure over the sternocleidomastoid muscle with a gauze sponge. The first assistant applies similar pressure on the opposite side. The incision is made through the skin and platysma muscle along the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Bleeding in the subcutaneous tis sues is controlled by hemostats in Ligation with fine OOOO sutures as the surgeon approaches the upper extent of the wound, he or she must avoid dividing the cervical cutaneous nerve, which lies in the superficial investing fascia. Figure 3. The sternocleidomastoid muscle is then retracted laterally in its fascial. Attachments along the anterior border are divided. The omohyoid muscle crosses the lower portion of the incision and is divided between clamps figure 4 hemostasis is obtained by oo ligature the inferior end of the omohyoid muscle is retracted posteriorly while the superior end is retracted medially figure 5 as the middle cervical fascia investing the omohyoid in strap muscles is divided in the upper portion of the wound the superior thyroid artery is exposed, divided between clamps, and ligated, figures 4 and 5. The cervical visceral fascia containing the thyroid gland, trachea, and esophagus is entered medial to the carotid sheath. The posterior surfaces of the pharynx and esophagus are exposed by blunt dissection. The diverticulum is then usually easy to recognize unless INF elimination is present, causes adhesions to the surrounding structures, figures 6 and 7. If DIF faculty is encountered in outlining the diverticulum, the anesthesiologist can pass a rubber or plastic catheter down into it. Air is injected into this catheter to distend the diverticulum. The lower end of the diverticulum is freed from its surrounding structures by blunt and sharp dissection. 
Its neck is identified, and its origin from the esophagus located, figures 6, 7, and 8. Special attention is given to the removal of all connective tis su surrounding the diverticulum. At its origin, this area must be cleaned until there remains only the mucosal herniation through. The defect in the muscular wall between the inferior constrictors of the pharynx and the cricopharyngeal muscle below. Care must be taken not to divide the two recurrent laryngeal nerves, which may lie on either side of the neck of the diverticulum or in the tracheoesophageal groove. More anteriorly, figure 8. Two stay sutures then are placed at the superior and inferior sides of the neck of the diverticulum, figure 9. These are tied, and straight hemostats are applied to the ends of the sutures for retraction and orienta tion. The diverticulum is opened at this level. Figure 10. Care being taken not to leave any excess mucosa and, on the other hand, not to remove too much mucosa to prevent narrowing of the esophageal lumen. At this time the anesthesiologist passes a nasogastric tube through the esophagus into the stomach. It can be seen within the esophagus as the diverticulum is divided. Figure 10. A two-layer closure of the diverticulum is begun. The first row of interrupted OOOO suture is placed longitudinally to invert the mucosa with the knot tied on the inside of the esophagus, gentle traction being used on the diverticulum to enhance the exposure. The diverticulum gradually is excised as the closure progresses, figure 11. Then a second row of horizontal sutures closes the muscular defect between the inferior constrictors of the pharynx and the cricopharyngeal muscle below. These muscles are brought together by interrupted OOOO sutures. An alternative method is to divide the diverticulum. With a linear staple after thorough irrigation, careful hemostasis is obtained. A small closed suction celastic drain may be placed, and the omohyoid is rejoined with several interrupted sutures. The platysma is reapproximated with fine absorbable sutures, and OOOO. Non-absorbable sutures are used to close the skin in a subcutaneous manner. Adhesive skin strips in a lightweight sterile gauze dressing are applied. These must not be circumferential about the neck. The patient is kept in a semi-sitting position and not allowed to swallow anything by mouth. Water and tube feedings are provided through the nasogastric tube to maintain FLUID and electrolyte balance for the first three days. The drain is removed on the second postopera tive day. Unless contraindicated by excessive serosanguineous drainage or by saliva draining from the wound. The nasogastric tube is removed on the second or third postoperative day, and the patient is started on clear fluids. The diet is advanced as tolerated. The patient is permitted out of bed on the first postoperative day and may ambulate with the nasogastric tube in place but clamped off. Antibiotic coverage is optional, depending upon the amount of contamination.